My uh, father was born in London, England. My mother was born in Brantford, Canada. They both immigrated to the U.S., I think, in their high school years. Um, they were married, I believe, in Chicago, where I was born. Uh, I have two sisters, uh, one younger, one older, both deceased. And when my younger sister was uh, born, my father never went to the hospital to pick up my mother. He disappeared. So my mother raised us in Chicago, two sisters and me. Wow. Well, what was it like growing up in Chicago? Uh, it was uh, a tough city. It still is. Um, uh, we were very poor. Uh, my mother worked as a receptionist. Uh, I think she may, maybe made $70 a week at her highest pay. Never owned a car. We always lived in an apartment. Um, but uh, I think we had a good life. My mother had five sisters and two brothers, four sisters and two brothers. And uh, of the four sisters, three of those uh, husbands were uh, Second War veteran, World War veterans, and... Uh, one of my of her brothers was a 82nd Airborne uh, combat veteran, jumped into Normandy. So he was a big influence on my decisions later on. Wow, very interesting. And God bless your mother for you know raising you and your siblings all by herself in a city, in a, you know, hard time and probably not having a lot of money. I can understand that was probably extremely challenging for her to do. Yeah, that's before any government assistance. As far as I knew, she never had any one cent of government assistance. Yeah. So what help she got was from her sisters and brothers. Strong family connection within your family. Yes. Strong family. Uh, your relationship with your siblings was very strong growing up? Um, it was fairly good. Both my sisters married uh, young. 16 and 17, and moved away. Uh, yeah, before I even went to college. So they were out of the house. Interesting. Speaking of college, um, tell me about the schools that you attended. If you remember, um, you can start as early as elementary school and work your way up and we can talk about the different schooling you had while in Chicago. I went to two different elementary schools as we moved, and uh, then I went to Lane Tech uh, High School, which was a, a school that drew students from the whole north side of Chicago. And at the time I attended, there were 5,000 students, all male. And uh, because of the war years and the baby boom, it was in a period when they had two graduations a year. So they started and graduated uh, both in September and February. So I was a February start and graduate. And th so that was um, like primary schools? Primary school and then high school. Yeah, primary schools, I don't remember much. Uh, um, but high school uh, was, a, was a good school, very, uh, at the time, one of the best schools in the city. And uh, I took four years of mechanical drawing. I was on the wrestling team for three years. Uh, we won the city championship when I was a senior, and that led to a scholarship for wrestling and my grades to McMurray College in Jacksonville, Illinois. Wow. What years were the, like, what year would you graduate high school and then transition to college? Graduated in uh, February 1963, and uh, college didn't start until September, so I had a job as a draftsman for six months or so until I started college. What was that like? Boring. <laughs> I decided I didn't want to spend the rest of my life behind a drafting table. So drew mostly I was drawing machine parts, screws, nuts, bolts, gotcha. different. So that was your work experience before the military? That was before college. Okay. Uh, then w went to college. I was in the wrestling team and it took me two years to flunk out. And, uh, after I flunked out, uh, I moved. I 
went out to New Jersey where I had a girlfriend from college and I started working there, at, actually working on a golf course, construction of a golf course. And uh, my mother wrote me a letter and said that you have a draft notice. So I went back to Chicago and enlisted before I was drafted. Okay. So that influenced the draft, influenced your decision to just not even let them have control of you, but yeah. enlist yourself. I think you have to know what the time was like. I have nine friends that I hung around with all the time. Uh, of those nine friends, seven went in the military. Wow. Two didn't, and they both married young. And of the those seven friends... Three of them went in the Marine Corps. Two of them were killed in action. Sorry. And um, then one uh, went to the Naval Academy, retired as a four-star admiral. Another went to work for the Atomic Energy Commission as a weapons designer. Um, another went to West Point, was thrown out, and then we were college roommates the second year of college. He was thrown out for hitting an upperclassman, typical Chicago guy. <laughs> and... Uh, Let's see. Another, the one that survived the Marine Corps never went to Vietnam. He had good duty in Puerto Rico at uh, Guantanamo. Wow. So you were surrounded by a lot of people who were in the military or influenced by the military. Um, before we began our interview, you talked about how some of your family members in the past had also served. Would you like to elaborate on that? Yeah, my mother's four sisters, uh, three of them were married to military guys. Uh, one was a Navy uh, machinist who was on, on a ship that was hit by kamikazes off of Okinawa. Another was a tank driver in New Guinea. A third was a submariner. And uh, let's see, I think that was all. Um one of her brothers was a professional boxer, and he was injured and never did military service. And the other brother, the younger brother, uh, was a paratrooper, jumped into Normandy in uh, World War II, and uh, served throughout, was wounded in Belgium, hospitalized, and then discharged. Wow, interesting. And you said um, it even goes back further than that, correct? Yes, uh, Great, great, great grandfather was General Schofield in the Civil War, and uh, um, Schofield Barracks is named after him, and uh, Schofield's rules of discipline are su still used at West Point. The discipline which makes the soldiers of a free country reliable in battle is not to be gained by harsh or tyrannical treatment. On the contrary, such treatment is far more likely to destroy than to make an army. It is possible to impart instruction and to give commands in such a manner and such a tone of voice to inspire in the soldier no feeling but an intense desire to obey, while the opposite manner and tone of voice cannot fail to excite strong resentment and a desire to disobey. The one mode or the other of dealing with subordinates springs from a corresponding spirit in the breast of the commander. He who feels the respect which is due to others cannot fail to inspire in them regard for himself, while he who feels, and hence manifests, disrespect toward others, especially his inferiors, cannot fail to inspire hatred against himself. It was, you know, just all part of what we did. Uh, another friend, a uh, uh, Japanese-American, uh, uh, went to flight school and flew uh, jets uh, off carriers off of Vietnam. Um, trying to think. Uh, another one went in the Navy, never went to Vietnam. And he was an officer as well. I was served mostly in Spain. And uh, so all my friends basically went in the military. And uh, I say my first cousin uh, was a Marine. He was killed in Vietnam. Same time I was there. Unfortunately, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, given the times when you were enlisted and going in, were your family members ever concerned or had any backlash towards your decision? Because No, I, I don't think there was really any issue about it. Um, I was kind of a wild kid, and they probably thought I needed the discipline. Right. So, and I did. <laughs> so you receive a draft notice, but you decide to enlist instead. 
what made you decide to enlist in the branch that you ultimately go into? Well, I enlisted in the Army mainly because of my Uncle Fred, who was in the 82nd Airborne, 508th Parachute Infantry Regiment. And, uh, and I had been working on a golf course, learning how to operate heavy equipment. And I thought, well, I'll enlist as a heavy equipment operator, and I'll have a, a career, a job when I get out of the service. And that was my primary motivation. When I got to basic training, again, I had been a wrestler in college and uh, actually went to the nationals as a freshman. So I was in really good shape. And uh, when I got to basic, I was just astounded at uh, how out of shape most of the trainees were. And um, it, I really had qualms about going to Vietnam with those guys. Um, they put me in charge of physical training and I lasted two days. And they complained so much that the drill instructors um, fired me, basically. And I used to box or weight lift on, on Sundays I had off just because I needed something to keep me in shape. Right. So basic training was kind of a wash. It was at Fort Polk in the winter. I enlisted in February. So uh, weather was not good. Do you remember what year? 66. 66. February 66, there was a lot of, uh, of meningitis going around during basic training, and uh, it was cold and wet most of the time. And uh, so I was in basic training, and uh, the Special Forces recruiters came to the post, and they were playing the Ballad of the Green Beret on the loudspeaker, and uh, it was raining, and our duty that way was drilling ceremonies, marching in the rain. So I said, well, I'll go take the tests. So I went in and uh, took the two days of testing for Special Forces. And uh, and after, uh, I think there were probably 200 guys that went in to start the testing. And we completed it. It was myself and one other that was asked to enlist in Special Forces. So uh, it was some tough... Uh, I guess questioning, intelligence type stuff, psychological stuff. Um, but at any rate, they accepted me in special forces. And so from there, I went to, to advanced. Oh, and they also said, because I had two years of zoology in college, which I only took because I was a, a jock and had to have it for my uh, physical education degree. And uh, so they made me a medic, which I wasn't too happy about it. Because I, ever since I was 16, I had weapons. I was a good shot. I used to go to the rifle range a lot, and pistols and so on. So I was not happy about being a medic. So I sent me to Fort Sam Houston for advanced training, medical training, and then from there to jump school, and then from jump school, which I did in July, and then on to Fort Bragg in August of 1966. What was your most vivid memory when you were in training? In basic training, I guess the most vivid memory was that how out of shape these guys were and that I really didn't want to go to Vietnam with them. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Uh, did you leave anything behind when you went into training? Uh, like a career, uh, your family, children or pets or anything? Uh, were you just by yourself? And yeah, I was pretty much on my own. After I'd gone to college, I basically never went back to my mother's house, which she had remarried at this point. And so I never really went back there. Gotcha. I understand that. Um, you mentioned how some of your family members might have thought, you know, he might need the military because he was a rowdy kid or anything like that. Did you ever find it challenging to adapt to the militarization? I never found it challenging. I mean, I was always small and skinny from my age. When I started high school, I wrestled at 95 pound weight. And uh, when I graduated, I was wrestling 112 pounds. So I was always small and skinny and I was almost always in a fight of some kind or another. Someone would say something to me the wrong way and I'd fight. That was just the way it was yeah. growing up. 
Gotcha. And my mother always said, you know, you never take any crap from anybody. Especially, don't let anybody give any crap to your sisters. So I was fighting all the time. <laughs> so I guess I needed some discipline. Yeah, that makes sense. What, um, what was the biggest challenge you faced when you were in training? Uh, I think in training, basic training, being around people from other parts of the country, I had some experience with that in college, but uh, it was really interesting to be around uh, people from New York, from uh, the South, and and trying to understand their dialects. So that was that was one issue, and I think at that time, a lot of the NCOs were career military guys and probably not the brightest bulbs. That was long before they had uh, uh, NCO training and testing and, uh, you know, move people out of NCO positions when they couldn't hack it. Yeah, that makes sense. Speaking of the NCOs or any other instructors that you might have had, do any of them, uh, whether in basic, advanced, or special forces training, uh, stick out in your mind and do you remember who that individual was and just the influence they might have had on you during training? Um, there were a number of really professional NCOs. Most of our training was done by NCOs and some officers, medical corps officers, but the NCOs were fantastic. And a number of them had been Korean War veterans, some even World War II veterans, and they'd been in airborne units or in the uh, for special services, uh, Darby's Rangers, things like that. They were hardcore, good troops, and they were, for the most part, very fair. I'm talking about special forces training. Hard. Uh, they used to say hard as woodpecker lips, but they were good guys. And I don't remember any names, but I do remember one uh, crusty old master sergeant, uh, I was in dog lab training. I was in the pharmacy mixing a, a complex compound. And the, he uh, came in and said, go out there, everybody out there, unload the truck. So the E7 was the principal instructor. And I said, can I stay in there for just a minute and finish this compound? He said, sure. Two minutes later, the E8 came in and said, what are you doing in here? <laughs> and he really gave me a, a ration of crap. And um, so I ended up cleaning the sewers under the dog lab pens every night for two weeks, polishing the bricks, scooping out all the, the dog stuff was uh, washed down in there every day. And uh, that was just for uh, being slow to respond to his order. But he was a tough old master sergeant. He was killed in Vietnam also. So I remember him <laughs> just for those two weeks. Yeah. When... Uh when you completed basic, when you first uh, finished basic, what were your feelings uh, upon that completion? Well, I'd already been accepted for special forces, so I knew where I was going. And uh, the basic medical course, advanced uh, AIT course for medicine was pretty basic stuff. But we did it, and uh, for me, it was just a good time in San Antonio. Uh, it wasn't very challenging in any way. And then on to uh, jump school, which I did in July at Fort Benning, and it was about 100 degrees every day and the same amount of humidity. So that was tough. Jump school was tough in just the physical part of it. But uh, again, I was in the one of two to be selected for uh, Mr. Airborne, a trainee of the cycle. And uh, I still had a little bit of a gut from all the weight I'd gained in uh, basic training. I gained 15 pounds in basic training. Most people lost weight. And that was because I was getting three squares a day. And uh, so I had a little gut hanging over my belt buckle and we we're in a classroom and sweating with our shirts off. Uh, and uh, so when I had the inspection for Mr. Airborne, there was a uh, a line across my belt buckle where the sweat had been and that disqualified me that the other guy got Mr. Airborne. <laughs> Sometimes it's silly things like that that, yeah. you know, you just remember. Right. Uh, what about your uh, feelings 
completing special forces training? Well, special forces training, um, I was just excited about everything. The, the first few weeks uh, training were, uh, were basic uh, special operations stuff, uh, map reading, uh, methods of instruction, which are very important in special forces. You have to be a teacher. Uh, survival, hand-to-hand -hand combat, ob obstacle courses, that sort of stuff. And then I, and I enjoyed all of that. And uh, then I went into medical training. And uh, the first part was held at uh, Fort Sam Houston, Texas. And that was very advanced medical training. We were trained by nurses, doctors, dentists, veterinarians. So we learned nursing care. We learned surgical operations. In fact, uh, we learned how to do uh, amputations. Uh, we learned veterinary care, how to treat animals. And mostly it was animals you might run across in Vietnam, pigs, buffalo, elephants, and, uh, and dentistry. And we learned how to pull teeth using anesthetics, of course, and uh, but not much other in the way of dental practice. And so we had very good instructors. And that was a very long course and a hard course and washed out a lot of people. And then from there, we went to an OJT, which was uh, four weeks at a hospital. And I went to Fort Dix, New Jersey. And there we rotated through various specialties, surgery, uh, dermatology, uh, boy, emergency room. I'm trying to think there was... Uh, four or five rotations we went through with physicians, you know, side by side, shoulder to shoulder with the physician. Good training. And then when we weren't in training, we used to all, uh, us medics, my buddies and I, we'd uh, go to the emergency room and sleep in the emergency room on a table and ask to be called if any good cases came in that we could work on, and which we did. So uh, gunshot wounds, uh, which were not, very frequent in the military, but uh, one trainee uh, blew his head off with his M14 on the rifle range. Uh, another time working on the ambulance, we went out to a, a housing area, and it was a black housing area, and we picked up a guy who'd been shot in the liver, and I knew he was dying, but we got him to the hospital. Uh, so OJT training was very good. I got a chance to work with recruits and do sick call in the dispensaries. Uh, and then we went on to the most difficult part, which was dog lab. And in dog lab, they took dogs from the pound that were going to be uh, destroyed and uh, took them, we put them in, in the large cages, and then we brought them back to health uh, with good um, diet and inoculations if they needed it and cleaned them up. And uh, so you got to know your dog, your animal. And uh, you bonded with them. I did with mine. And then uh, after, I think it was three or four weeks, the whole time we're doing medical classroom work and uh, testing every week uh, on tropical diseases and trauma, all the usual stuff. And uh, so then we'd, uh, the dog would be anesthetized and then taken into surgery, and you would amputate your dog's foreleg with a surgeon watching you to make sure you did proper amputation. And uh, oh, take that back. First, they were shot in their hind leg. Uh, and then you had to treat that wound without antibiotics until we, the dog was walking again. And so with my dog, uh, it took a week or two before he was walking again. And I made a a splint for his leg with a big spoon I filched from the mess hall and fed him buttermilk every day I got from the mess hall. And then after he was walking and uh, the instructor said, yeah, you did a good job with the wound care. And uh, again, no antibiotics, just wound care, basic nursing care of the wound. And uh, then you'd take him in to do the amputation. And after the surgeon approved the amputation, then they give me intracardial injection and killed the dog on the table. That was tough. The first dog I ever had. Yeah. I imagine that training has probably changed dramatically from yeah. that era. Yeah, it was not too long after that they switched to goats and they still train with goats now. No, no more dogs. Yeah. Especially with that 
emotional bond you get with a canine. Yeah, I don't think any anybody emotionally bonded with the goats. <laughs> That's got to be tough, though. Yeah. Uh, and all that was just in preparation for what you could encounter on the battlefield? Correct. As a medic, you're responsible for your team, your indigenous forces, and uh, the medical care of the people that you're working with. And special forces, at least in Vietnam, we're mostly working with indigenous people. Uh, and A camp said maybe two or three hundred, uh, either mountain yards, Cambodians, or Vietnamese, and uh, a twelve man team. So a twelve man team would run a, basically several companies or a battalion of indigenous troops. And um, I went to SOG Studies and Observations Group, which was the cross border operations into Laos and Cambodia. So I went from Okinawa to Vietnam in that operation, and all my troops were Chinese Nung. And so we had a company of Chinese Nung that our team uh, was responsible for training for and leading in combat. So anyway, the medics are responsible for the health and welfare of the team and, and the indigenous people. So were you, with all the medical training that you had going to special forces, your primary role was medical support? Or were you uh, like infantry or something different? In special forces, your primary duty is special forces, and medic is, a, is your specialty. Okay. So you have to know all the responsibilities of the other guys on the team. You have to know some of their MOS, demolitions, communications, um, and uh, operations intelligence were the basic specialties. And we all, of course, all carried weapons. We're proficient in our weapons. So in dog lab training, uh, not only uh, was it typical in that we had to study and, and take uh, written tests every week, but we had to care for our dogs and then do the operations, of course. But it was especially difficult for me because two weeks I was cleaning sewers every night, so I wasn't getting much sleep. And I still passed the tests, but of the go the guys that started the medical class with me, only 11% graduated. So the medical training was pretty tough. And I was lucky I had that two years of zoology in college. It gave me some background anyway. I was def definitely disappointed. I, I asked if I could keep the dog and ship him back to Chicago. And they said, no, no three-legged dogs running around Chicago. We don't need any more publicity. <laughs> But they, no, he said, you have to kill it. And I, this was right in the operating room when I asked to save it. And they said, no. And we were all scrubbed, everything. We had an anesthesiologist and scrubbed them. I and it was basically like an operating room. Yeah. And that just, night uh, after, after the first surgery, when the dog was shot in the hind leg, I uh, slept on the floor with it all night because it had fluctuating temperature. It, it was go up and go way down. And so I was treating it with um, aspirin. And the only way I could give the aspirin was put on a tip of my finger and put it up its butt. And then it would get too cold, so I'd filch coffee from the NCO in charges who was sleeping, coffee pot and fill rubber gloves and warm them up with that and, and cuddle with it basically to warm it up. So I, that's what kept my dog, I think, from having serious problems after it was shot the first time. I think probably was over anesthetized. So after medical training, then we went to the final phase of special forces training, which was more classroom work and also a field operation where we act, we jumped into uh, North Carolina and into the mountains and uh, we were supposed to work with a guerrilla group, a guerrilla group that were made up of civilians and 82nd Airborne troops. And so we did that two-week operation. That was my first tree landing at night, which was fun. <laughs> Landed in the top of a tree. Uh, and so once completed that training successfully, then we were given our green berets and uh, shipped off to our unit. Okay. And what was that first assignment after training? First Special Forces Group in Okinawa. Okay. And what were you doing there? Uh, started out, I was a Spec 4, Specialist 4. I'd been promoted while I was in dog lab. And uh, first assignment was to work in the uh, Special Forces Dispensary, where you treated Special Forces troop day-to-day -day stuff, colds, uh, uh, the normal stuff, a lot of VD, 
And we also trained uh, other military personnel, including MPs who had a barracks right above our dispensary. So I did that for four or five months. Uh, I was then promoted to sergeant. I think I'd been in the Army 20 months. And my first assignment from Okinawa was to go to Taiwan for a joint a U.S. Army Special Forces, Taiwan Special Forces uh, training mission. It was two months long, lived in a small village in northern Taiwan. And uh, it was good, also good training and uh, worked with ch first time working with foreign troops. And these were Chinese troops. What was the relationship like with um, Taiwanese or Chinese troops? Uh, th these, the troops were all Chinese and, and the villagers were Taiwanese. I actually spoke a different language. Oh, okay. And, uh, and the Chinese troops, you know, looked down on the villagers, like most troops do in most countries everywhere, it seems like. But um, it was an interesting, uh, this uh, group of Chinese troops walked into the village where I was staying, and a small puppy uh, started uh, jumping on one of the Chinese troops' legs. And uh, later, the Chinese troops invited us to dinner. And... Uh, so I learned to use chopsticks, and they were they were fairly friendly. They were teaching me how to use chopsticks, picking up peanuts with the chopsticks. And then they served the meal, and we all ate it. And I thought it was pretty good. And they said, you know what you just ate? That was the puppy. And I said, no. <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> you know, that, that can't be. So he reaches in with a big ladle and fills up the lower jaw of the puppy. <laughs> so I had my first meal of puppy in Taiwan. But it was a good exercise. Turned out pretty well. Yeah. After that exercise, where do you go from there? Uh, it was either right before that or right after that. We did civic action missions out in the small islands of the Ryukyus. Uh, one or two of these islands had only electricity for a couple hours at night. No motor vehicles. And mostly farming and fishing. Sugar cane raising. And uh, we did... Uh, medical screening for schistosomiasis, and we did a lot of dental work. I think one day I probably pulled 40 teeth. And so it's mostly old people that have been sucking on sugar cane their whole life and rotten teeth. So I uh, did that and did two of those operations. And then after Taiwan, uh, I was training to go on a mountain ski team to northern Japan, Hokkaido ski training. So we were training on the grassy hills in Okinawa with great big wooden skis. And uh, Sergeant Major called me in and said, uh, how would you like to go to Vietnam? I said, sure. And doing what? And he said, can't tell you, but you're replacing a medic that was wounded at uh, Quezon. We had a team at Quezon at the time. And um, so I said, sure. And uh, and they, uh, everybody in Special Force had a secret security clearance in order to go to this operation to go to SOG. You had to have a top secret. So uh, it took a day or two for them to get back and found out that uh, they gave me the top secret, but they found that my mother never became a U.S. citizen, so she was an illegal alien the whole time living in Chicago. From Canada. From Canada. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, so she'd never become a citizen. And so anyway, they gave me the top secret anyway, and I went off to Vietnam with the team. We just uh, flew into Da Nang right from Okinawa on a C-130. And that was kind of an interesting flight as we'd... Uh, I had a Japanese girlfriend at the time who has been my wife for 51 years. Um, so anyway, we uh, drank a bottle of sake or two the night before I left for Vietnam, and we went out to the airstrip, and I was still drunk, probably hungover and drunk, and uh, got on a Marine Corps C-130 to fly to Vietnam, and an hour out, the engine went out, we returned back, sat on the runway again with all our gear, and by this time, I was really hurting. And then we got back on the C-130 and flew to Vietnam, and an hour out of Da Nang, another engine went out. So we landed in Da Nang on three engines. That was my start to Vietnam. Yeah. So prior prior to landing in Vietnam, all those operations were either support for U.S. troops, collaborations with Chinese 
or Japanese troops yeah. or what was no, in Okinawa we didn't do much uh, training with Japanese home defense forces they were called I don't think there were any there because it was still a US protectorate right so there were no Japanese forces there but uh, we did train Marines on Okinawa uh, we did field exercises in northern training area with Marines and Basically, I would give them medical training, how to give them morphine serrette, how to put a tourniquet on, bandages, that sort of stuff. And we also, uh, well, this is later on, right before I, I uh, was discharged, but I was part in the northern training area in, in Okinawa. And I was an instructor there where we did uh, training for troops, Army and Marines going to Vietnam. Okay. And part of... Uh so, like, doing the dentistry and, like, pulling teeth for individuals, was that also strictly, like, for military purposes, or was it also sort of like a humanitarian? Humanitarian. These were all Japanese civilians that we were treating on the island, small islands. Uh, as far as when I worked in the dispensary, uh, we didn't do any major stuff. It was basically treating normal things. There was a lot of BD in Okinawa, so... We did a lot of uh, treatment for gonorrhea and so on. Okay. And then you land into Vietnam after the engines, the three engines going on, all that. Now you're going to an actual war zone at this time. What are your feelings arriving in Vietnam? Well, again, I volunteered to go to Vietnam, and I was looking forward to it because all my training, I thought, you know, I've got to put it to use. I've yeah. got to get over there and do something. And uh, so I remember in the ride in a, it's basically a bus with uh, wire mesh over the windows from the airfield to our camp, which was south of uh, Da Nang called Marble Mountain, right on the China Sea. So it was a beach area and then a camp and it was restricted to only SOB personnel, studies and Obser observations group personnel. So it, no even regular SF could get in there. So it was top secret base and uh, I joined my team that I knew maybe two of the guys on the team in Okinawa. I didn't know the rest. Most of the senior NCOs didn't associate with us, lower ranking guys. So anyway, I met the team when I got there and I was the junior medic on the team. A senior medic was a good guy, an old uh, special forces type. Um, so anyway, we got to Vietnam. I get there, and in fact, they were doing uh, grilling steaks and drinking beer on the beach from when they were, we arrived. And uh, I thought, so this is the way I'm going to love this. Never happened again. <laughs> but that was my first day in Vietnam. And uh, so we had a, a long house, basically. Half of it was supposed to be uh, Vietnamese special forces and our team in the other half, right on the beach, in the sand, basically. And that's where we trained our troops and launched from there to other launch sites before we went into Laos, which was, again, all top secret. And it's been de declassified. When we, our first day, actual duty day there, I mean, I arrived on a Sunday, and the Monday we had a classified briefing, uh, no notes, and we had to sign a disclosure saying that, you know, you're going to go to Leavenworth if you ever disclose anything that you're hearing today. And so they pull the screen back and show the map of our operating area, which was in Laos. For our area, it was Laos, basically. Other units further south operated in Cambodia. And I was also on the roster to go into North Vietnam to do search and rescue for downed pilots, but I never did it. So, um, so we had... Um, basically a company of Chinese nuns that we were to train and to take on operations. So I did medical training, weapons training, airborne training. We trained uh, a bunch of them uh, on airborne training, did the whole thing right there in camp, jumped out of Marine CH-34, Vietnamese CH-34 helicopters. And it was interesting. We had a POW camp just to the side of our compound where North Vietnamese prisoners were kept. And two of the guys that uh, jumped, two of these young guys that jumped with us, landed in the minefield around the POW camp and walked out right through the minefield. And so we think that the VC had already dug up all the mines because it was a basically Marble Mountain. We learned later there was a hospital and munitions factory right under Marble Mountain, which was a protected site because it was a Buddhist temple, basically. 
So in camp training, there was a lot of training the indigenous troops, and then we take them on operation. But also, um, as a junior NCO, um, I about every ten days I had to go up to the top of Marble Mountain, which was you walked up most of the way and then you had to climb a rope ladder about 40 feet to get to the top and it was just a small little area up there and you had a radio and uh, binoculars and you just watched for what's going on in the area. So one time I was, well, one time going up there, somebody was sniping at me when I was at the rope, going up the rope. So I climbed that rope pretty quick. Uh, and one night while I was up there, uh, we had to, our camp, the mountain, and marine amphibious camp, amphibious camp, the tracks right on the beach over here. And then the village is right down below us. So we're up there and uh, actually been watching the movie in the marine camp with the binoculars, just be out of boredom. Yeah. And uh, but then watch a squad of marines come out of their front gate and walk through the bill and they got fired up right there and then about a thousand meters away was on another peak was a marine with a fi marines with 50 calibers and they started firing down into the ambush site and most of the marines that were killed or wounded had 50 caliber slugs in them we were only 250 meters away but i never even thought about putting any support of fire in there it just yeah. it was too close that's unfortunate yeah so we had a lot of issues. I mean, I Corps in Vietnam was all Marines. Only basically other services were Air Force bases and uh, some Marines, but not uh, some Army, but not very many Army, mostly Special Forces. Right. Well, we took we took the um, Nung Hatchet Force. Uh, it was about at that time we had about sixty troops, and we um, went by chopper to Phu Bai, which was another Special Forces launch site and base and uh, we there we combined with about 60 Cambodian troops in this camp at Fubai and uh, the Cambodians and the Nungs didn't get it long at all in fact there was a quick draw shootout in the main street of the camp one night another time uh, somebody threw a grenade in a bunker where there was a poker game going on so the Chinese and the and the Cambodians didn't get along at all and so we even had to set up a separate mess hall. They wouldn't even couldn't let them eat together because there'd be too much conflict. Yeah. So from Fubai, then we launched into Laos, which was an area called Oscar Eight, which had seen some of the highest casualties of the war as far as pilots shot down and and special forces teams lost. And so we went in, uh, got in there in late afternoon. 140 men, 14 Americans, so some special forces from our team and some from the Fubai with the Cambodians. And uh, we get into Laos and we started digging in on a grassy hilltop. And that night, fog drifted in and it was pretty much foggy. You couldn't see anything, but we heard track vehicles all night long. We didn't know if they were tanks or bulldozers. And uh, it had been a couple of months earlier than that with the Long Bay camp up near uh, Quezon had been overrun by tanks. So we knew that there were, that they, BC and NBA had tanks. So we could hear tanks all night long and we were just on this grassy knoll and the heaviest weapons we had were some laws, which were useless basically. And uh, next day we moved off that mountain and down into a valley, filled up our canteens in an area that had been uh, sprayed with uh, Agent Orange and everything was black and slimy and and so we filled up our canteens in this water that was <laughs> contaminated. Then we moved up another mountain to the area, which was our mission was to assess a, a bomb damage, do a bomb damage assessment, in which the three B-52s had flown over and bombed this area, which was supposedly some sort of headquarters. And it was just a mess with these uh, huge craters everywhere. I mean, there was hardly any flat ground in between the craters. And we never found any evidence of enemy other than we found wires with porcelain insulators up in the trees. So right at that site was bombed. That's where we spent the second night. And my squad was in the tail end of the line that was stre stretched up this sort of ridge line. And uh, interesting first night in the combat zone and, uh, and uh, 
we had leeches, of course. I had one leech got on my leg and it came off during the night, so my whole leg was covered stiff with blood when I woke up after only an hour or two of sleep. And, uh, but that night before sleeping, we could see over in the next mountain just hundreds of lanterns going up and down the hills. So we were in a really hot area. So the next day we moved up to the top of this mountain and we dug in there and basically was bait for the North Vietnamese. And uh, the first wounded I treated was me. So we got hit uh, right as it was getting dark and they were firing up. I was in a hole, they were firing from this side. I crawled out of my hole and I was up like that and I got hit through the cheek and the nose with a round. It was really close, knocked me down. And uh, I fired a couple more magazines and then uh, they broke contact. And that was would be night number three. That was the third night in, in Laos. And uh, so we had a bunch of wounded, including my squad machine gunner, a Chinese kid who was taller than most. He had been standing up when they hit and was shot through the knee. And so uh, I was trying to straighten my nose out because it was all bent over. I stepped my fingers up and did that and straightened it out. So I was the first one I treated. And, they, and then another American further up the line was calling. We had wounded, you know, calling boxy, boxy. And so I, I crawled over to Nui because I wasn't about to stand up after just being hit like that. And we knew they were nearby. And um, so I said, Nui, are you okay? And he was funny. He was doing like, I'm okay. And I'm looking. He's laying on the stomach, but his toe was pointing straight up. So he was my second casualty. I had to turn his leg around and splint it. And morphine, of course. And it was too dark. I couldn't get an IV in. So I saved it. I only had one IV anyway. So I saved it. And uh, the next day we had um, bombing all day long on both sides. Everything. Gunships. Spooky. We had Spooky at night firing up. And then we had uh, F-105s and F-4s bombing. And uh, they were so close, you could actually see the pilot's head as they flew by. Because we were up on this ridge line, as they were, you could see their head. And uh, uh, the Americans on the other side of me, on the other side of this ridge line, dug in, had his M79 laying in the dirt, and he got a pellet from a CBU through his M79 barrel. That's how close they were putting it in. Another Nung, uh, calling again for boxy medic, and I go crawling over there, and... Uh, He's pointing to this huge hunk of shrapnel from a 750-pound bomb, and it was concave a little bit. And apparently it had come down through the trees and landed right on his head. And he had a goose aid that was, I swear, like that, just like a cartoon goose egg on the top of his head. And all I could do is give him some aspirin. Yeah. <laughs> and I said something like, call me in the morning. You know, take two aspirin and call me in the morning. But... Uh, yeah, so they were putting in the air and pretty close, and they and daylight bombed all day and then spooky all night. And then uh, we called for extraction, and uh, Powers B said, you're on a five-day mission. This is day three. Call us back in two days. And we knew we were surrounded. Uh, so the next day I had maybe 20 wounded, uh, one American killed from the initial assault. And... Uh, that's another story. He was a master sergeant, or start first class. We uh, promoted to master sergeant after KIA. But he was with the Cambodian troops further up, and uh, I was moving up that way to check on wounded. And um, another uh, American special forces said, "You got to help me with this body. It's down the mountainside. I don't, I don't want to go down there, but I did." And so I handed my M16 to a, a Cambo and I said, you know, cover me. And uh, so I went down the mountain and I got the rope on this guy, uh, this master sergeant, master Robert Plato is his name. So I sort of low crawled with my arms under his arms. He'd been shot through the chest. So now I was covered in his blood and gore and got him up to the top and wrapped him in a poncho. And so the next day I was going to evacuate him on a chopper plus about the 20 Campbell wounded and uh, maybe three or four dead. And uh, at any rate, uh, next day I'm on this little 
landing zone that I had helped cut out with a chainsaw with a rope tied on me. So I was down there hanging on the rope, cutting all the trees down with a chainsaw. That was right before they hit us that night. So anyway, it was so small that uh, a Huey could get its skids on it, but that was about all. The tail would be out, out in the air. And then the H-34, a Vietnamese H-34, could only get his front wheels down. And so they had to come in hot with a lot of power. And an H-34 came in to evacuate our dead and wounded. And he was probably not 30 yards high level with me as he was coming in. NBA jumped up, hosed down the chopper with his AK. I could see the bullets hit and fuel spurting out. I could see the pilot's face. And I thought, well, he's going to come crash right on me and the wounded. But he didn't. He did one of those things and went down the mountain, crashed and burned. And on that plane... On that aircraft, H-34, it was another Special Forces guy by the name of John Hartley Robertson. And the movie Unclaimed was made about him. The guy in Vietnam claims to be John Hartley Robertson. And it's an interesting movie. You ever get a chance to look at it. Anyway, that was the movie I did three minutes in, describing how I saw the plane shot down that he was on. And the next day, the Air Force bombed the wreckage anyway. But the interesting story in that the bodies have been recovered from that site, but not his. And this guy in Vietnam that claims to be him who has dementia, forgot how to speak English, married to a Vietnamese woman, had been a POW and then released. But at any rate, an interesting story. The Canadian film company brought him to Canada to meet his sister. And his sister, he said, that's my brother. And But the U.S. government wouldn't recognize it. The guy went back to Vietnam. As far as I know, he's still there or probably has died by now. So the Air Force comes in and they pretty much bomb everything just to evacuate. Now it's day five and you're able to finally do your evac and uh, call for the exfil and yeah. get everybody else out of there. How, how did you feel the comms were at the time with the rest of the American forces or whoever you're out? Well, we, our captain, actually there were two captains, our captain and a captain from the other team that were on the radio with the, with the pilots. And um, after the H-34 was shot down, then American pilots came in and uh, Hueys. And basically they came in from the other side. And as they come in, we start firing down the mountainside and try to suppress it. And they they fly off and say, no, no shooting. We can't tell if it's you shooting or they're shooting at us. Throw grenades. So as the choppers would come in and take five to six guys out per time, and we had 140 guys, and one chopper at a time would come in. So we just lob grenades down the hill. And uh, and our team, uh, the team from Fubai was the last team out, but we got all the wounded out, the dead out first, then the, the Cambodians and the, and the Chinese, and then the Americans. Then our team, and then the last team out was the Americans from uh, Fubai. But uh, getting on that chopper, man, I said, wow. <laughs> Whew. <Yeah. laughs> it was a good feeling because I'd been out of water for a day. I brought a Chinese kid that had been shot five times through the legs with an AK into my hole when I was taking care of him. And I left my half canteen of water in there and he drank the whole thing. I was so mad. My tongue was swollen. <laughs> and um, at any rate, we got on the choppers and out of there and got back to Fubai. And then um, your wound that you suffered, was everything good to go? Yeah. Self-treated and you were able to take care of all that? For yeah, it was, wasn't much of a wound at all. It was just enough to knock me down pretty good. Yeah, and a close, almost death, Yeah, which is remarkable. And my nose has never been the same, but at any rate, it's, uh, I finally had surgery a few years ago and took a big bone spur out, and then I can breathe better after that. Yeah, crazy. Um, so after that mission, which was a five-day mission, you said you, go, you went back to, uh, I forget the name of it. Marble Mountain. Marble Mountain. Now, where, what is your mission there? And what are your assignments? Still training those Chinese troops that we had taken on that first operation. And we knew how badly they needed training after that first operation. Okay. And, uh, and that's when we did the airborne training as well as uh, weapons training, patrolling, normal stuff. And I did the medical classes, of course. 
Um, and we were right on the beach. And so we'll, on our free time, go swimming, go fishing with grenades, do some target practice out on the beach. Uh, one time we were training the uh, Chinese troops and uh, we we're doing 60 mortar training on the beach and we had floating target out in the water. And uh, a Navy patrol boat came by close in shore. It was chugging along out there. And so we said, cease fire, cease fire, take a break, you know. And uh, we were talking, my butt, another SFC and I were talking and all of a sudden we heard, thump, one of the Chinese dropped a mortar round. And you could see the 60 mortar round slow going up and see the boat coming like this and it was a near miss and uh, of course that was the end of our firing on the beach for yeah. Navy and the Marine Corps didn't like that did you have to go back to Laos or Vietnam uh, during your time in service at that moment uh, never went on another cross-border operation we did a couple operations in Vietnam with our troops trying to train them up and I would say they were poorly trained they were supposed to be Chinese nuns, but they're mostly just Cholan Saigon kids, basically. I'd say 15, 16 years old, no military experience. Um, so we did a lot of training and uh, took them on a couple operations. Uh, one, we went into the Elephant Valley, which was uh, supposedly a free fire zone and uh, no contact there other than the Marines firing over our head all night long. And uh, yeah, that operation. Uh, oh, and the other thing, we went there by truck. So we, again, everything's I Corps, Marine Corps. So we called the Marine Corps and said, will you please mine sweep the road ahead of us? We're going to the Elephant Valley. And so about halfway there, we see the mine sweepers coming towards us. <laughs> Okay, we cleared it the old-fashioned way. You can turn around now. Yeah. So it was just a lot of foobar with, you know, working with Marines. And another time, in this ville right next to our camp, there's a crossroads where the road from Da Nang went through and going south, basically. And um, so the Marines find a small mine in the intersection. So they put a demolition charge on it, and they go back 15 or 20 feet and blow it up and there was a 250 pound bomb under it and killed a bunch of marines and civilians so we it doesn't i know it's like anti-marine but it just seemed like there was so much of that going on there the marines just had poor leadership and i understand now why my two friends my cousin and my good friend were killed they just it was kind of wild yeah, we had two radios. We had the PRC-25, and then we had this HD-2, which was a handheld thing that took six or eight D-cell batteries, and a uh, big clunky thing. And uh, at the time we were in the Elephant Valley, I spotted two uh, black-clad guys running to the rice paddies below me, and I was on the ridge line basically, and I, I uh, tried to call my lieutenant, who said, you know, don't fire unless I give you permission. But it was a pre-fire zone, and these guys were in black pajamas, and and so uh, I get on the H2 and I'm calling and calling, no contact. And by the time, uh, you know, they just uh, disappeared into the trees. So I never did get to take a shot at them, but uh, the radios were, were not good. So is that the extent of your first time in service? Um, back training? Well, individuals are different, like you know, Chinese. Uh, military, yeah. our military again. And that. Then I went back to Okinawa, and that's when I went up to the northern training area, and I, we were training Marines and Army for deployment to Vietnam. And we had a course for the Marines where they'd come in on a rubber boat, run through a swamp, uh, and then we'd train them in repelling and weapons and uh, things like that. But uh, when they'd run through the swamp, we'd put charges in the, in the mud and blow them up as they went through and try to give them some sense of uh, what what combat would be like. And then we had machine guns in blocks that we'd fire over their heads. And we did training, weapons training. We, we taught the point-and-shoot weapons training where you take an M16 and you block off the sights. And um, you have somebody with a ping-pong ping ball. Uh, actually, these were 
BB guns. I take that back. Later we did the M16s, but BB guns, and you throw a ping pong ball up in the air and then hit it without sights, and it was the idea of point and shoot. And what you're looking at, you'll hit. And after a while, you're pretty good. You could hit the ping pong balls. And then we did the training with the, the sights blacked off, and when it was getting dark, and targets, silhouette targets at, at night without sights. And so it was good training. Uh, all that's in Okinawa? All in northern training area, Okinawa. We had all kinds of weapons, foreign weapons, U.S. weapons, and guys like me, they were weapons nuts. I love shoot 50 calibers and anything I could get my hands on. And M79s, uh, the 40 millimeter grenade launcher, which was a lot of fun. And we had bunkers built that we could try to get the M79 through the slit of the bunker and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, it was good training. But I'd already met my wife and I'd asked her to marry me and she said no. She said, I'd never marry a crazy special forces guy. I said, if you get out of the army and get a good job, then I'll think about it. Yeah. So that was one of my motivations not to re-enlist. Okay. So is Okinawa your last duty station initially? Well, uh, we did another two months training operation in the Philippines where we parachuted into northern Luzon at 2.30 in the morning and uh, linked up with Philippine Special Forces and we were ostensibly going to do a training mission, but we also had live ammunition because the New People's Army were active in the area at the time. So we had live ammunition and of course we ran into any of them, we were to take them out, but... Uh, Two months living in the jungle, sleeping in a hammock in the rain, and, and training these uh, Philippine Special Forces and me doing medical civic action in the villages it was pretty much uh, it was a nice training operation. Yeah, and then uh, came back from that, and um, my time was up. Oh, I extended four months to go to the Philippines. That's what it was. I extended four months, and then so my time was up. I'd already done uh, three years and four months. And so going back to the U.S., I was just going to get a discharge. But I'd already been contacted by USAID in Laos by a friend of my senior medic in Vietnam. His good friend was in Laos, a medic, and uh, contacted me, wrote to me, asked if I you know, wanted to come to Laos and we're doing basically the same thing I did in Special Forces. And I said, yes. So that was the reason I got out of the Army instead of re-enlisting. If I would have re-enlisted, I would have went right back to Vietnam anyway, which I wasn't too crazy about after being there the first time and seeing how foobar it was. Were you able to communicate with your family and keep, give them updates at all? And, you know, how did that work? Stay in touch with loved ones? Yeah, I couldn't. And only family I wrote to was my mother. And I couldn't tell her much of anything. I told her I was working in a hospital in Saigon, which was BS. But she died while I was in Vietnam. Oh, sorry. So they sent me back emergency leave, 30-day emergency leave. I was only gone 10 days, and most of that was out-processing and processing. I got there. Was, she's, the funeral already happened. I just said, i got, got to get back to my team. They need me more than I need to be here. So... Uh, you know, I had to go through Oakland Army Terminal again. I had to go to 5th Group and the Trang again. You know, it, so it was about going oh, Cameron Bay. So <clears throat> out of the 10 days, it was probably seven days of processing in and out. So I got back and um, just got back into training again. Um, what kind of friendships did you form while serving and... Who were they? Do you remember their names? And oh, oh, yeah. I have a lot of, a lot of good friends. In fact, um, most of the guys that were in my company, we were a company for Special Forces. We were, we were pretty much buddies. And there were a lot of good guys, a lot of senior NCOs and staff sergeants. Mostly were the guys that I hung with, uh, sergeants and staff sergeants. But uh, I'm still in contact with a couple of them. Several have died. The guy that introduced, he was going with an Okinawan girl and, mar and uh, he eventually married her. But they introduced me to my wife, who then I married. And we've been married for 51 years, as I said. Um, but um, I still am in contact with a couple of the guys that's still alive. In fact, I just got a Facebook posting from one of them the other day, uh, who is uh, 
a guy that went to the fifth group from first group. When I went home, he went to the fifth group uh, for a full year tour, and he got the Distinguished Service Cross there. And uh, he's quite a quite a guy. And uh, in Okinawa, there were things that we, when we weren't training, we had a lot of opportunities. We could skydive. You, you could take pilots training. There a little airfield there. Uh, it was Okinawan dojos, karate training. Uh, a lot of guys did that and learned the Okinawan style karate, you know. Uh, what was the movie, you know? Yeah. Can't think of the name of it now with the young kid and the old guy. He is Okinawan. Oh, uh, the karate, karate kid. kid. Yeah. And yeah. Now so, they have Cobra Kai. Yeah. So, so the, yeah. Yeah. So they, the instructor uh, was an Okinawan guy. So they had good karate in Okinawa. A lot of the guys did that. And scuba diving. I did a, quite a bit of scuba diving. So you did have a lot of time at least to get away from the warfare and have some recreational downtime and do some leisure activities. Yeah, and Okinawa was a great duty station. We had a lot of parachute jumps. We had a 90-ton 90 90 tugboat for water jumps that would go out and you could jump into the Pacific there. And, uh, uh, yeah, it was, it was good duty. It was nice duty. Did you, uh, you recall any humorous or unusual events that might have happened and if you did are you able to share them if not we could talk uh, about it offline in okinawa um again i was we were always fighting and okinawa was also full of marines and uh, i already developed a bad taste for marines and uh, so we we're always fighting we got into a fight with a bunch of MPs, and uh, they turned out to be mostly army, but uh, four or five of us get locked up in the, uh, not locked up, but in the police station, and we're all handcuffed on a bench, all lined up. Maybe there were six or seven of us. I was the only one they didn't handcuff. So this big MP, army MP, comes walking down the line, starts slapping everybody around. They're handcuffed behind their back, can't do anything. And they're slapping him while I said, you raise your hand at me, I'm going to knock you on your ass. And he did. And I picked him up, wrestling, double leg, takedown, dropped him right on his head. And they beat the hell out of me. <laughs> they uh, handcuffed me behind the back and just worked me over with boots and nightsticks. And uh, so I, and then I end up in jail and the sergeant major, four in the morning, comes and gets me and just laughs. <laughs> And Sergeant Major, who turned out to be a really good guy, the same guy that uh, asked me to volunteer for Vietnam. But at any rate, uh, so I then get uh, two weeks of extended duty as my punishment. And so the extended duty is to clean the group uh, commander and the group Sergeant Major's office every night after duty. And, you know, mop the floors, empty the baskets, do all that stuff. And so I go in the first night of uh, my extra duty, and the group commander is Robert Roll, is a famous special forces officer who was the guy that was imprisoned uh, in Vietnam for the killing of the Vietnamese double agent. And he was fifth group commander. Uh, Creighton Abrams imprisoned him, and he ended up, you know, washing out of the military, but he was a great officer. So anyway, I told him the story of, of what happened with the MPs, and both he and the Sergeant Major just laughed and said, you're dismissed, no extra duty. And so when I was leaving for um, home, he was at the airport going to Vietnam, where he would end up in prison, jail, and all that stuff. And he came over and talked to me, surrounded by all these officers. I was just an E-5 sergeant. And he came over and talked to me and, you know, asked me how I was doing. He remembered the whole story about the, the fight and the, all that. And there was a little bit more to that story, but I won't go into it now. Uh, but at any rate, so he came over and talked to me and wished me good luck and everything. And then he went on to Vietnam and ended up in that trouble over that uh, killing of the double agent. But uh, he was a great officer and the guys would have followed him anywhere. I think the best part was just being around these senior NCOs that were World War II vets and, and Korea vets, airborne, you know, they were just straight and tough and really smart. I mean, we had a number of guys that were 
college educated NCOs. Another, we had one staff sergeant was a lawyer. And uh, so we had great guys. Uh, just, uh, I mean, I was just so honored to be amongst them and be accepted by them. And uh, so it, that was, I think, the best part of Special Forces for me up to that point okay. with, with, the, with the men. I mean, it, it, I was just a young kid, basically, and they taught me everything I needed to know. How old do you think you were at that time? In your mid oh, let's see, I or turned 21 in basic training, so 22, 23. Yeah, so still a very impressionable young man who still yeah. had a lot to learn. All right, and those guys worked hard. Yeah. Knocked me into shape. <laughs> so you get discharged, and then you transition to doing this operation in Laos um, as a job, as a, co- a contractor? Uh, yeah, it was, it was a contractor, a Federal Service Reserve Officer, Foreign Service Reserve Officer. And uh, <clears throat> so I went back to Chicago, and it took six months for them to get a new top-secret security clearance. I already had one to go to SAW, but it took six months for that paperwork to go through. So I, then I go to Washington, supposedly for training, and it was about two weeks, and it was basically how to get your password, passport. It was a diplomatic passport, to, you know, how to fill out all these forms and do all this for your American Express card and you know, just that. Not much training. They showed a movie of Pop Buell, who was a guy working in Laos, and I think there were about 15 other people in my class. None of them went to Laos. I think I was pulled out just to see that movie at one point. But anyway, after two weeks, put me on an airplane, sent me to Vincennes, Laos. After three days in Vincennes, the capital city, I was up country working. So uh, what did you do in Laos? I was a medical supervisor, public health advisor for Military Region 2, which at that time had a population of about 250,000 and where the heaviest fighting in the war was going on. It was where the special guerrilla units, mostly Hmong and other hill tribes, were fighting the North Vietnamese. So I had a, a, a warehouse full of medicine. I had about 100 medics and nurses, 70-something dispensaries out on the mountaintops all over northern Laos. And my job was to train them, supply them, pay them, and uh, keep the thing going. Were you ever a target just being an American or as a civilian, do they like do they respect that and like abide by what we would consider like normal military code? Like you don't attack civilians. Well, I used to fly in single engine aircraft all, almost all day. Some days I'd make twenty takeoff and landings on these little unimproved mountain strips and platus porters, which are reversible prop or helio courier. Or later on, we had choppers. But uh, I would bring the medicine out. I would. Uh, treat anybody that needed to be treated that the medic couldn't handle, or I would then put them on the airplane with me and bring them back to our hospital. And so that was my day-to-day responsibility. That's what I did every day from dawn to dusk. And uh, and I lived up in Sam Tong, which was a mountain headquarters for USAID up there in northern Laos and military region too. And... Um, lived there, and then every couple of weeks I'd go down to Vincent to our office, public health office, and do paperwork or do whatever I have to do, file reports, put in more requests for medicine, do that sort of stuff, then back up for another 10, 14 days. And uh, did that for five years and nine months. Did you have to um, indicate that you were medical, like wear like the Red Cross or anything like that, or it's just all... No, no, I carried weapons just oh. like I did in, in uh, Vietnam. So I had a car 15 and that pistol. And you see in my medical bag, I had several grenades. And uh, I, again, wore civilian clothes. And, uh, and all my medics wore civilian clothes. Some had been ex-military, but it was, a, it was a good operation. We helped a lot of people. I mean, we were the primary medical care for those 250,000 mostly Hmong tribes people. And uh, as the North Vietnamese uh, encroached further and further into Laos, we evacuated them from their mountaintop villages, moved them into refugee centers, and uh, 
And uh, at the end, uh, it was difficult because he had to leave everybody behind. And um, we tried to get some people out. And I personally helped a number of people get across the river to Thailand. But uh, there were thousands that we left behind. A lot of them were killed. So I then left Laos, went back to the States, and I was amongst the last 26 USAID employees to leave Laos. Apparently, there had been some embassy people there after I was there. But we are kept in a compound where I happen to live for two weeks, surrounded by uh, Pathet Lao guards, and kept there for two weeks. And you know, it was every day dicey whether we were going to get on or not. Finally, they let us out. And uh, my wife and son had already been flown to Bangkok about three weeks earlier, so I'm staying there with the other uh, dependents. And we met them up in Bangkok and then flew home and uh, started the next chapters in my life. Well, I had basically nothing, nowhere to live, no car. I had some money in the bank. I'd saved money while I was in Laos, and I was married. I had a two-year-old son, and so we moved in with my sister for a short time till we found an apartment. Uh, found an apartment, and uh, I started working uh, in home remodeling, uh, got trained by a good guy, a good carpenter, and uh, so I started doing that and went back to school at night and got my degree. And uh, just as I was about to graduate, I uh, got a call from Ross Perot, who I'd met in Laos, and wanted to know if I wanted to go over to the Sinai and the peacekeeping team. And uh, I was to graduate in two weeks, and I went to Houston to interview, and they said, you got to start in 10 days. And uh, I said, I'd like to graduate. You know, it's been 16 years since I started college. I'd like to get, you know, this, and then I'll go. And they said, no, you got to go in 10 days. And I said, well, sorry, never mind. So uh, I'd got a couple of offers like that after I got out. One was to go to Angola as a medic. And the only two Americans were killed there was a special forces, ex-special forces medic who was also in Laos with me. And uh, so I uh, got the call from an agency guy and said, you know, we'd like to go to Laos, uh, Angola, 50000 a year to start. And it uh, sounded good to me because I was making you know, $10 an hour or something working in Chicago. And uh, so... Uh, his guy says, I'll get back to you in 10 days, two weeks, and uh, we'll have everything all set up. So one morning during that time period, I opened up the Chicago Tribune, Angola Falls. <laughs> so I missed that one by the skin of my teeth. And so I called the guy number who uh, left me the number and, and uh, I said, I'd like to talk to so-and-so. And I said, there's nobody here by that name. And... Uh, and so when I got the phone bill back, it was McLean, Virginia, you know, CIA headquarters. <laughs> so anyway, I didn't go on that one either. And then later, also another guy, uh, the, the hostage rescue was, was originally Bull Simons, the Special Forces legend who led the raid into uh, North Vietnam to rescue prisoners, was originally going to do that, but he died. But uh, before he died, through another guy, they called me and said, you know, Bull is putting a team together. Are you in? And I said, of course, yeah, anything Bull Simon. So that was the hostage rescue. And Bull Gritz ended up taking command and doing that. Of course, it was a disaster. Um, but anyway, that was the last time I was contacted to do anything. So right then, as I graduated, the guy who got me the job in Laos, the Special Forces Medic, calls and said, I'm working for this medical company in Pennsylvania. You want to come out and work? And I said, why not? So I started uh, working in this medical company, and they, I was training foreign students on repair and maintenance of the equipment. And I'd, I'd done that for three or four months. And the head of marketing came to me and said, uh, and he was ex-Special Forces at SOE and, and Danish citizen, but parachuted in fighting Nazis as a resistance fighter. And he said, you know, you'd make a good salesman. I said, what? 
and uh, that was 1977 and I started a career in medical sales and marketing which I did for 20 something years and my first assignment was all of Asia so I had to travel to 14 countries of Asia go for six weeks to come back for six weeks go for six weeks and uh, trained uh, and sold equipment and uh, that's what started on a medical career and which the end of my medical career, I started a medical uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing company, a startup company that never really got off the ground, but we raised five and a half million dollars and the FDA kept screwing with us and changing the goalposts and finally we just had to give up. But uh, yeah, that was it. And that whole medical career was because I was initially a special forces medic, which I didn't want to be. <laughs> So that's how life, I think, yeah. goes. Were you in the reserves already at that time? Um, in the beginning stages of your career? After, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think. While I was going to school, I joined the reserves. Yeah, when I got back to Chicago, probably within a year of getting back to Chicago, I joined the reserves. And this was the Illinois National Guard, actually. And they had a program then, if you were an E-5 in combat with a college degree, you could get a direct commission. So I was given a direct commission, second lieutenant. By then, the guy in Pennsylvania had called and said, you know, you want to come out there? So I left the National Guard, went out to Pennsylvania and joined the 11 Special Forces Group out there. And so I was a Team XO out there. And uh, so then, after coming back from Pennsylvania, back to Chicago, I joined 12 Special Forces Group and I ended up retiring from the 12th Special Forces Group as a major, and I was commander of headquarters and support company. So I spent almost all my reserve time, ex other than a, less than a year, in Special Forces. That's great, though. Mm -hmm. You know, you still able to utilize what you've learned in your career mm -hmm. um, that you did outside the military, but also still contributing while being in the reserves and helping with those other you know, military members and it's yeah i had some good duty in the reserves i was a, a team commander oda commander i was a assistant intelligence officer for the group i was a group a medical operations officer i was a battalion uh, s3 uh, and then the last assignment was commander of headquarters and support company it was a 385 man company Basically, and I had one major and four captains under me. And uh, so that was interesting duty. What is your proudest moment of your career? You had a very lengthy career. When it comes to the military, what are you most proud of? I think the most proud of being accepted by Special Forces and being, you know, accepted into the brotherhood of Special Forces. And uh, I'm still involved in the Special Forces Association and the Special Special Operations Association, two organizations that I'm a life member of. Uh, I don't go to many meetings because I'm not into that, but uh, I stay in contact with guys through that system. I, I joined Vietnam Veterans of America for a short time, uh, didn't like that organization, was an American Legion member for 31 years. I joined while I was in Laos. Uh, so I uh, I think the military, I mean, it taught me many things. I mean, it taught me responsibility, first of, all, first of all. And the main thing is it taught me that I find so lacking in today's world is it taught me to take responsibility for my actions and not to blame other people or other things, but take responsibility and then go forward. Yeah. I think that was, a, and I think I lacked self-confidence when I was younger, when I was in, in school. And of course, I had all the confidence in the world when I had that Green Beret. Yeah. That's definitely yeah. a very um, prestigious group to be a part of in the military. And that's remarkable. Yeah. In fact, uh, when I wrote my book, uh, one of the guys that did, two of the guys that did the forward, one was uh, a... Uh, Army colonel who served in the 12th group and actually 
talked me into joining the 12th Special Forces Group when I came back from Pennsylvania, was a POW for more than five years, was wounded and captured while I was in Vietnam, and then spent the next five years while I was in Laos in a POW camp. And in 1973, when he was released, he came to Laos. He was backpacking around Southeast Asia, already been to Vietnam. And uh, I got a call one day from the ambassador's office and said, we've got this guy coming in. Uh, would you show him around? I said, well, Mr. Ambassador, why me? Well, he's a special forces officer, ex-POW. I said, bring him over. And I took him all around uh, Laos, took him out to the Plain de Jars, which was under communist control at the time. Uh, took him everywhere. And uh, we've been friends ever since. And he wrote one of the forwards to my book. The other guy that wrote a forward is John Stryker Meyer, who's written three books and uh, really was one of the first guys other than John Plaster to write about SOG operations after it was declassified. Yeah. Wow. You yeah. got amazing friendships, amazing connections. Yeah. It's such a fulfillment of a career and military service. It's a very unique story you have. We I mean, just keep going on and on. Yeah, I could tell a lot of stories, but I guess some of our best unsaid. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you mentioned how the military service had impacted your outlook on life in terms of taking responsibility for your actions and being held accountable for what you do. Do you do you think that your military service affected a way uh, affects or affected the way you relate to, to regular civilians and other American citizens? Without a doubt. I have a hard time, uh, I guess, bonding with people that didn't serve, uh, especially those that were on the other side protesting. And I was very, I wasn't very political when I was in the military, I, but I think it just all rubbed off on me that, you know, conservative, pro-military, pro-small government, sort of Republican. But uh, then when I went to school, back to school, I took, uh, I majored in political science, Asian studies and international relations. And that's where I think where I developed my strong conservative views. And uh, when I flunked out of college the first time, <laughs> the first two years, uh, I wasn't a very good student, but I went back, I got straight A's. So it, Do you think it's all a matter of maturity and, yeah. and you know, being able to, to uh, accomplish, set a goal and accomplish it. And that's something else I think you learn in the military. Do you think the military service you had impacted your feelings about war and the military in general? It certainly has. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Um, you know, I think... I was still in the reserves when Desert Storm first came up and I was, because I was on the Special Forces Unit at the time I was an ODA commander, uh, we were put on 24 hour alert, 24 hour alert for Desert Storm, but we were never called up. Um, I then volunteered uh, later and was not accepted. Um, probably because of my age, I was in my 40s by then. But... Um, yeah, and uh, you know, it really disappoints me today is the the military has all, always been a metrox, metra, equal opportunity organization. You know, you did your job, you were rewarded, you promoted, but you had to do the job. And what I see now is it's just become another social experiment. Too much wokeness, too much uh, political correctness, and not enough about what the military should be, and that's trained to fight wars, not nation built, but fight wars. And the military is a fighting to fight a war, to win a war. And it doesn't need to be going into the so, all the social stuff like the post office, for example. You know, the military isn't the post office. It's completely different and it should be different. But uh, I am not happy with the way things are going right now. Well, we've, uh, I've done a lot with veterans uh, in the organizations that I'm a member of, but one of the proudest things I think is I, when I lived in Wisconsin, after I retired from my civilian job, I uh, 
met up with a bunch of Hmong families that lived there. And the first thing I did was give them uh, four acres of my property to grow vegetables. And so I got to really meet up with the Hmong who I'd worked with in Laos. And through that uh, relationship with the Hmong, I also got involved in building the um, Lao Hmong American Veterans Memorial in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. So it was my idea to build it. I helped actually construct it. I raised money for it, over $35,000 personally. Uh, made a DVD, which I sold to raise money for that memorial, and it's still going in Sheboygan. And uh, uh, I'm very proud to uh, have uh, helped in that organization. I support Hmong veterans and Hmong veterans organizations as much as I can. I have many Hmong friends who visit me all the time. And uh, so I'm probably most proud of that. And that was because of my service in Laos, working with the Hmong for those six years. I saw the devastation and the in a way, they were just killed off fighting the North Vietnamese. Over 30,000 Hmong were killed during that war in a population of 250,000. Yeah, and another so ten to 20,000 killed after the U.S. pulled out, killed by the communists or fleeing across to Thailand. What would you like people to know or remember from your story, what we talked about today. Like, what is the one thing you want people who do see this to take away from what we discussed? Well, I think the military could make a man out of a bad boy, and they did in my case. I think uh, I've never been so proud or honored to have served as I did in Special Forces uh, and to be recognized by my peers. Um, that, to me, has been most important. Uh, the friendships I've made that have lasted for these 50-odd years or more are very important. And also the work with the, the Hmong veterans and Lao veterans that I've done over the years has been very rewarding. I feel like uh, it's my responsibility to do what I can after we abandon them in Laos. I could, maybe one other thing about the Hmong... Uh, I've been very fortunate to run into some of the Hmong that were in Laos with me later in years. And um, one of them was um, a village leader by the name of uh, Nikong Nia Herlo. And uh, I used to stay at his house evenings and spend the night with him. And, uh, and we had a medics training at his village. And uh, so I got to know him pretty well. And... Uh, Several years ago, I happened to be up in the Twin Cities, and my wife just had to go to Marshall Fields to get something special in the mall there in the Twin Cities. And I was walking out of Marshall Fields. I see this Hmong family, and I look, and there's near her low. And he was uh, had some dementia and a little bit senile. He didn't recognize me, but his wife jumped up right away and hugged me. And around him were his kids. He had... Uh, of his kids, he came to the country penniless, a refugee, one school teacher, one nurse, two lawyers, two MDs. That's a generation out of Laos where kids had maybe lucky three years of education. They were basically in the Bronze Age, had no knowledge of Western anything. In one generation, they've done that. And still today, the college... Uh, Graduation rates and PhDs are just a phenomenal number of Hmong in this country. Just one, now two generations. What do you wish more people knew about veterans? I think they probably should know that veterans, are one, they're task-oriented. They like to have a job and do it well. I think most veterans have the discipline to do what's needed, and uh, and I would think that the younger veterans today uh, should be hired immediately because they're going to be dependable. They know how to take orders. They know how to get things done. And when I was working in the medical field, I see so many young guys come in that could just talk a great game, but they didn't know how to do anything. They couldn't do anything. And that's what I think veterans, they get the job done. Just like you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Three years ago, I wrote this book, and it's available on Amazon, and basically details my uh, six years in Laos, but also a little bit about how I got there through Special Forces. And it's been received, I think, fairly well. I expected to sell maybe 300 copies, and to date, I've already sold 4,500. Also, I have some photos that I'd just like to take. This is a picture of me getting ready for an operation in, in Vietnam when I was a sergeant. This is a photo of me back in Okinawa after Vietnam. And this was at my last parachute jump in the 12th Special Forces. Uh, I jumped twice that day in Arlington Heights, Illinois. Well, um, thank you for taking the time to share your revelations of your military service. Very uh, thankful for you to participate in this program.